Coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We're digging into the Cattlemen to Cattlemen archives to show you some of our favorite stories. Find out which ones made a lasting impression and are worth another look. Now, from the Denver headquarters of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, it's NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Hello and welcome to this week's special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Auctioner. Thanks for joining us. Over the years, we've brought you many great stories from all across the U.S. And today, we're going to take a look back at some favorites. These stories often feature families or operations that left a lasting impression, while some were just a lot of fun. Now, one thing we love to do is highlight the great work of state cattle associations all across the country. Our first story looks back at Minnesota's summer beef tour, which brings together cattle producers, consumers, and community leaders to help share the beef story. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brad Bulla has more on this important event. Each year, the Summer Beef Tour, hosted by the Minnesota Cattlemen's Association, draws a big crowd. This time around, more than 800 people rode the buses and visited a variety of farming operations in the lake country near Starbuck, Minnesota. Minnesota State Cattlemen's Association Summer Tour. This is a 37th annual uh, summer tour that we've had here with our association. And every year it moves to a different part of the state with a different local cattlemen's association hosting uh, the tour. This cattlemen's tour has been going on for years. It's an opportunity for that local group to showcase the unique parts of agriculture in their section of the state. And then also invite different community leaders and um, industry folks from around the state and in their community to come and understand a little bit more about what they're doing on their farms and ranches. For cattlemen and women, the Summer Beef Tour provides valuable networking and education. We started attending the Summer Tour many years ago just to see the new practices um, that are being put in place in the state of Minnesota. All the different facilities, different types of cropping, pasture management, rotations, that type of stuff. So we can learn new ideas, new thoughts, new processes and take them home to our operation and try to implement them in our operation. So I think it's really important for us to come out to the beef tour and kind of get a different perspective on how different producers raise cattle and the different techniques, the different types of equipment that they all use and kind of what a building could look like. Right, right now we're in a great example of what a monoslope building could look like and kind of uh, learn a little bit from each other. One of the benefits of moving this around the state is uh, we get to reach out to community members and it gives people an opportunity who don't maybe get a chance to go to a farm very often uh, to hop on a tour bus and see multiple farms in one day and chances are they're sitting next to a farmer so if they have questions they can talk to that farmer. As the summer beef tour has grown over the past three decades, it's also become a valuable way to reach consumers and community leaders with the story of agriculture. That's been our goal of these, of these tours, is to reach out to the public, to get the public here to see what we do on our operations. And we, we've had people attend from normal, everyday consumers of our product that have a job in town to pollution control agency, comes on these tours. I think for consumers it's hard because they don't always have the opportunity to come on a farm and you know farmers are always busy from sun up to sundown so it's not always a great opportunity to come and, and showcase what they're doing but in this event it's perfect because it's it's a way to really engage the consumers I know here in this specific area there's a lot of lake cabin folks so there's a lot of people that you know maybe are, are living in the Twin Cities but have a cabin out here and don't understand agriculture and are, are not exposed to it so this is a perfect opportunity to bring them out, show them what they're doing on their farm, answer questions. Um, many of the people here are farmers as well, but for them to learn from one another is also really important. Reporting from Minnesota, I'm Brad Bulla for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. The Minnesota Summer Beef Tour is just one example of the great work that state cattlemen's associations do all across the country. You can find many stories celebrating those efforts on our YouTube page. We also have educational segments, producer profiles, and of course, Baxter Black. So check us out at youtube.com slash cattleman to cattleman. We also talk a lot on the show about the importance of passing on our industry to future generations. One very important part of doing so 
is making sure there are plenty of young people interested in becoming not only beef producers, but also industry leaders. Cattlemen to Cattlemen reporter Brian Baxter has more on one state's efforts to attract and engage young beef producers. The future of our industry are the young folks that uh, maybe are now showing in the junior shows and stuff. We have to keep them interested in the industry for them to want to continue on to do this as a, a livelihood. Involving young producers has always been a focus for the Ohio Cattlemen's Association. They've developed many activities to attract young producers starting from a young age and going through college graduation. One thing that our association has always tried to do is, is embrace change and as our industry changes uh, we really feel that it's important to keep some of that younger generation involved and have input and a voice on the direction of where we're heading. We think it's great to keep things fresh and we really want to keep our organization enticing to those younger members who always want to stay involved. We start our youth programs at the age of eight. Uh, we have several for them to be involved in and they're predominantly focused around either the seed stock or uh, show cattle portion of the youth livestock projects. In addition to that, um, it's more than just being in a show ring. We provide leadership and scholarship opportunities. As they get a little bit older, uh, we have junior boards that they can serve on, volunteer work and ambassador type work that they can do. One of the newest things is we have a student membership that we're rolling out right now and it's uh, kind of been designed to reach the people that are just a little bit too old to show in the junior ring and are in college and we want to keep them interested in the industry and reach out to them and keep them involved in committees, volunteerism and, and try to keep them moving forward so, uh, so we don't lose track of them and they don't lose track of us. Not only has the Ohio Cattlemen's Youth Program groomed future leaders of the association, it's also developed potential employees for Ohio's agricultural industry, including a staff member of the Ohio Cattlemen's. I began as a, an expo intern, industry relations, and then I was a best junior representative, and then I was a fall intern for both Ohio Beef Council and Ohio Cattlemen's Association, and then I was offered this position. As they get older, uh, we really try and connect some of those youth, um, those kids in our youth program to folks in our Allied Industry Council. Whether those be internships or scholarship opportunities, the chance to enter the workforce, be volunteers on different committees, and just serve in different leadership roles of the industry that they're passionate about is the groundwork, I guess, that we really try and lay for those kids who grow up through the ranks of the Cattlemen's Youth Programs. Personally, I I can't imagine life without being involved in the Ohio Cattlemen's Associations. It was something that I found that I belonged in and I grew some roots in there and I just took advantage of every opportunity that they provided. Leaders of the Ohio Cattlemen's Association know that continuing to offer options for young producers will pay off and keep their association active for years to come. They are our leaders and uh, of tomorrow. And I think sometimes we take for granted that they're gonna come back. And, and the fact is, if we don't engage them, keep their interest level up, interact with them through their college years, I'm saying that it's uh, not a given that they're gonna remain in our industry. I think the next generation of beef leaders is, is gonna be a special one. It's been great to see how excited the kids are uh, it was something that I wasn't even that excited at that age, so I'm, I'm almost jealous of how excited they are and at how young of an age some of these kids are taking advantage of these opportunities. Just the responsibility that we're learning and the leadership opportunities that are open to us. It definitely changed my life and I know it's going to change hundreds and thousands of others' lives as well. The young producers are important to the Ohio Cattlemen's Association because they're the ones who are going to make or break us, you know, and I think our future is very bright here in Ohio with the enthusiasm and professionalism that some of our young cattlemen here provide to our beef industry. In Ohio, I'm Brian Baxter reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Now, if you'd like to learn more about what's happening with NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, you can find us on Facebook. Be sure to like our page and we'll keep you updated with photos, details on upcoming shows, and much more. And it's a great way to connect with other cattlemen and women all across our country. So check us out on Facebook. Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, you'll meet Susie Sirloin, 
and hear about her passion for promoting beef. Plus, we'll meet a man who has found harmony in two seemingly very different careers. Stay with us. We'll be right back. There is a new world out there, revealing itself in unpredictable ways. A world that demands more from the land and those who grow, farm, and build on it. This new world calls for the ingenuity to get more out of it while preserving as much as we can. After all, to stay ahead of tomorrow, we need to be equipped for it today. Let's go to New Orleans. That's where the Cattle Industry Convention and NCDA Trade Show will be in 2019. It's the cattle industry's biggest convention for the first time ever in New Orleans, a city filled with great fun, great food, and an amazing history. You can't miss it, so make plans now to go to the 2019 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show in New Orleans, January 30th through February 1st. Visit ncba.org for more. Welcome back. Today, we're looking back at some of our favorite stories, the ones that we're still talking about. Now, when you walk down the streets of New York City, it's unusual to see many cowboy hats. But Suzanne Strasberger wears hers with pride. Brian Baxter has more on how Strasberger's Steaks is bringing prime U.S. beef to the Big Apple. On the busy streets of New York City, there's a lot to see. What you might not expect to see is this. That's Suzanne Straussberger, also known as Susie Sirloin, wearing her trademark cowboy hat. The Straussberger family has been in the meat business for nearly 150 years. So my grandmother's side of the family came from Germany in 1842. And on the census in 1852, it was written as a butcher. And from then on, my grandmother's side of the family was in the meat business, and my grandfather's side of the family was in the meat business. So everyone in the family was always about meat. I actually started at the bottom, and I had every single job in the place. I took inventories, I delivered meat, I unloaded trucks, and then I started answering phones and learning how to trade meat and buy meat and sell meat. And um, I, I just learned so much every day. It's such a great industry that we're in. Since its founding all those years ago, Straussberger Meats has grown significantly to become a well-known purveyor of high-quality beef to steakhouses and retail stores. The meat business has definitely changed over the years. When I first started in the meat industry, I was buying from beef plants that my grandfather bought from. So we learn from one generation to the next where the best beef comes from. And we feel very fortunate that, you know, the cattle come from all over the country and make their way to the Midwest feed yards where they're fed the best corn to make the best beef product that we get to sell. Beyond high-end New York steakhouses, Suzanne realized there were other opportunities to bring high-quality beef to urban shoppers. I saw there was two types of different consumers. The kind that liked the prime-age steak and to go out to a restaurant, and I saw that there were other consumers that wanted something else, wanted something different that they could bring home to cook themselves. So when I launched Susie Sirloin, I figured, why not all natural? As long as they're choosing beef in the meat department, I'm happy. The appreciation Suzanne has for cattle producers and the beef industry shows in her day-to-day -day work. No matter who she's talking to, she's advocating for beef. You know, having Suzanne Strasberger right here in New York City with eight million consumers right here, representing beef producers from all around the country and, and the product they produce in such a, a tremendous way. I mean, those dry aged prime steaks being served at Keene's Steakhouse, what a better way to represent the beef industry. Or her Susie Sirloin, uh, you know, ground beef products in, in, the, in the grocery store. And, and really the ability that she has to interact with consumers on a daily basis. I love to promote beef. 
This is what I get up for in the morning. This is what gets me excited. And there's so much misinformation out there and I feel like it's a part of my job to get the right information out. I love to give meat lectures and um, it's, it's just one of the greatest things this country has going for it is, is agriculture. It's a part of our history. It's a part of what has made this country. And it, it's fascinating how well we do it and how great the product is and how hard these families work. And, and I have to say that we are so grateful and we really appreciate all their hard work. Getting beef to the Big Apple is not always easy, but Suzanne knows New York City consumers will keep eating beef. I want the hardworking cattle producers to know that we love our beef. This is a steak eating town and when they're not at a steakhouse, they come to the grocery store. Keep up the great work. It's thanks to you that you help us be successful and spread the good news about beef. It's what's for dinner. I'm Brian Baxter reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Anyone with a genuine interest in promoting the beef industry is encouraged to enroll in the Masters of Beef Advocacy Program. There's no cost to participate and you can complete the program all on your own schedule. To get started, visit the website beef.org slash MBA. Over the years, raising cattle has inspired many farmers and ranchers to pick up a guitar, and write songs. Here's Russell Nemitz with a look at a Virginia man who's in tune, both with raising cattle and playing music. So I always wanted to write songs and I wanted to farm. So I moved to Tennessee and have been lucky, you know, with a career there. And then was always planning on moving back. My dad, my folks still live in the house right there. Uh, and he farmed this until about 80, he was 83. I mean, did it. And uh, then just couldn't really do it anymore. So we moved back here with the idea that I could do what I did from anywhere, right? The businesses are, are not dissimilar in that you're never gonna get rich. Uh, you invest all your money back into your businesses and you're more supporting your lifestyle than you are anything. It's a rainy morning in the Shenandoah Valley as Scott Miller gets his chores done. His love for the valley and his farm is obvious, and on this morning, even the weather can dampen Scott's spirits. It is awesome because I put down my fertilizer last week, so I'm looking like a genius. And plus, we've been dry as we can be. This valley, its soil, its grass, is an ideal place for cattle and has been. It was the breadbasket of the South in the Civil War, but that was mostly wheat, and everything around here was wheat. But as it switched over to cattle, this central location, everybody brought their cattle here. So it's just good grass and good, and good grazing, and, and you can do it with low impact and, and a lot of cows per acre. Although Scott is currently dressed for farm chores, soon he'll shed the coveralls and be on stage performing his music live at the Hamilton in downtown Washington, D.C. His work boots, though, will stay on as he plays. I used to always joke in Nashville, I was like, I'm the only guy down here that has actual cow flop on his boots, you know? And I don't think anybody believed me. I get up here, I'll feed, uh, feed the bulls, check everything. Right now, of course, we're calving, so there's always that to deal with. There's always something that's got to be done. Uh, and I can get out of here probably about 10.30 or whatever, uh, get back to the house, pack up. I can drive up, do that show, and then be back here early Sunday morning to repeat the process. Before returning to the farm, Scott built a career as a singer and songwriter, recording critically acclaimed albums and playing as many as 200 shows a year across the country and even in Europe. Now he's back home, but still writing and playing music. He's one man with two full-time jobs that can sometimes be tough to keep in tune. I see that all the time in interviews. They're like, Scott Miller, gentleman farmer. It's like, no, 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 no. Gentleman farmer get to, somebody else does their work, right? No, this is me doing this. This past summer, we built a, a, some, a lot of cross fencing and I built an alley through the woods behind you there so I can move these cattle from the back pasture and move them up here all by myself. The only problem with that is that nobody can see me do it. It's so awesome. 
<laughs> but because before I'd have to get, you know, call neighbors and get four or five people. And it almost was a two day process to get them back through the woods up here to this and then to get them in. So I built a number of wings where I can funnel them in and um, two different sorting pens. So it's just a matter of patience. I think sometimes farming by yourself may be akin to like not having a, a limb where you can do everything, but it just takes a lot more effort and twice as long. And like so many other cattlemen these days, Scott is aiming to grow his cattle business. Man, I, I want to expand um, and get a few more cattle, uh, more income. I've only got 200 acres, so I'm sort of limited. So I'm running a little over 60, and this past summer, now we did the NRCS where we came in, fenced off the woods, and I split some fields where I can graze a little more efficiently. So I'm hoping I can add another 10 or 15. So that's sort of, I'm trying to, still trying to find that balance. During a break from chores, Scott picks up his guitar in front of the bullpen. His music often reflects his love of the farm and the history of his home area. Dear Sarah, I'm stuck on a train bound for Richmond. We march down from Kernstown. You write what you know, and of course it's, it's in me. I mean, uh, I wouldn't say that I focus on it, but you can't help but where you grew up to have it affect you. And especially here. I mean, if you look, you can see the surroundings and the people here. And although the audience on the farm is not at all like the one that'll fill the room he'll perform in later, he appreciates these fans for the value they bring to his herd. They ran away, didn't they? Well, I think it's the best way to make my herd better and the most money efficient way is by upgrading kind of the quality of bulls. I mean, that's the easiest way. And that's just the most efficient way for me to do is to take my best heifers and keep them and, and breed up. Cavies is important to me only because if I've got to be gone, I can't, sometimes I can't be here. So I need something that I can turn my back on and know they'll be all right. There's no doubt life on the farm is a whole lot different than playing music on the road. But finding the harmony between these different worlds is something Scott Miller is committed to doing. Well, you know, I mean, farming's a challenge and you gotta love it or you don't need to be doing it. And this was always where I wanted to be and always what I wanted to come back and do. From the scenic Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, I'm Russell Nimitz for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Now, if you like what you've just heard, Scott's latest album, Ladies Auxiliary, is available now on iTunes and Amazon. Go to thescottmiller.com for the details as well as all the information on when he might be playing in your area. Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll look back at the recent cattle industry convention in Phoenix and a cool museum we're still talking about today. Don't go away. We'll have more right after this. Join the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. NCBA is the oldest cattle industry organization, working every day to defend your interests in Washington, D.C. And there are big benefits to being a member. You'll get news you can use in the National Cattlemen and policy updates from Beltway Beef, plus big discounts from John Deere, Cabela's, and more great partners. Join now. Call 866-233-3872 or sign up online at ncba.org. Well, I think a rancher has to be a steward of the land. There's nobody else that can take care of land better than a rancher. When we switched over to the uh, Perina products, it was a step in the right direction. The difference we see in the cattle is the consistency of their nutrition. The cattle hold their condition a lot better throughout the whole year. It does make a difference that we can see, day in and day out. Welcome back. The 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show in Phoenix was a huge success, with thousands of beef producers and industry stakeholders on hand to enjoy a mix of business, networking, and fun. Besides a lot of sun, the Phoenix area also had a lot to see and do. Russell Nemitz brings us a closer look 
at a museum that features some great Western art. Well, Phoenix, Arizona is indeed very excited to host the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and in CBA Trade Show. And of course, there's always a ton to do and see at the convention itself, but Phoenix itself has a lot to see and do as well. And a must see if you're coming to this year's Cattle Industry Convention is the Western Spirit Scottsdale's Museum of the West in Scottsdale, Old Scottsdale to be more specific. And with us on the segment today is their museum director and CEO, Mike Fox. And holy cow, Mike, I mean, seriously, if you have a passion for the Old West or Western art, this is the place to come and see. Well, this, we hope will be indeed the destination for your members and we will welcome them and really look forward to their experience here. You know, walk us through the museum here in Old Scottsdale because there truly is something to see and do for everyone of all ages. We just happen to be standing in this particular gallery, 1400 plus pieces of authentic cowboy and old western gear. Indeed, this is an extraordinary collection probably one for which you will see more spurs and, and uh, bu bits and bridles and any other institution for which might have some special collections themselves. This is an extraordinary collection, historic saddles, and uh, just a whole story about uh, the cowboy of the American West. And it's a collection that was amassed by one individual over a course of about 40 years. So we have the privilege to be able to present it to the public and have them experience it in some very special manner. And of course, the Old West has a rich history of uh, basically lawmen and those outlaws. And part of this gallery uh, showcases that part of American history. Indeed, it does. Lawmen and and uh, and also prisoners. Uh, those uh, wonderful items which they made with uh, horsehair in the prisons and uh, the rodeo and uh, the Western uh, films and so forth. So we, we have a wonderful collection that, uh, as you mentioned, includes about 1,400 works in this particular gallery. Of course, this is one of seven galleries. So this is just the tip of the iceberg of what uh, the visitor might be uh, experiencing when they're here. You know, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned it. There's several different galleries here at the uh, Western Spirit, Scottsdale's Museum of the West. And for those Western art enthusiasts, when you go upstairs, you're going to see some magnificent pieces uh, from all sorts of artists, uh, two notables, Frederick Remington and C.M. Russell. Indeed. Those are really quite extraordinary artists, as we all know, and the works which we have are, are just uh, stupendous. Um, and the beauty of what is upstairs is the story of the American. American West, historic to contemporary, and, and certainly the cattlemen is well represented in so much of the storytelling about the West. So, so many of the paintings and sculptures which we have deal with what the cattlemen deals with in their own life way to this day. And so I think it will resonate very much with, uh, with your attendees. Yeah, and what would the Old West and history be without a collection recognizing and celebrating Native Americans, too? And they're going to see that here at this museum. They will indeed. We will have a major exhibition of Hopi uh, pottery that will be on display, and it is now a gift to this institution. And it truly is the finest collection representative of seven centuries of Hopi creations. So that would be one example of, of a number of other wonderful Native American art that is on display throughout this uh, institution. Well, I absolutely love this museum and uh, we could seriously go on for hours. Uh, a couple of other things that really caught my eye during our tour here in Old Scottsdale. I'm an old uh, Western movie buff, oh, those old spaghetti Westerns. For others like me, talk about the old Western movie poster collection here at this museum. Well, we are so fortunate, along with Arizona State University, to have acquired a collection, the single largest collection of Western posters going back to the late 1800s to the present, actually. And we have uh, a collection of about 5,000 of them. We have a really significant exhibition that uh, really celebrates the contribution of, of the Western film and what has caused for people all over the globe to better appreciate our American West through the Western films. 
You know, I just want to wrap up talking about the building itself. I mean, the museum is relatively new. It was built in 2015, as I understand. It's quite a, a magnificent piece of architectural uh, magnificence in itself. I mean, talk us through the building because one of the new buzzwords in agriculture is sustainable, sustainability, and this building does all of that and more. It, it is an institution that uh, really helps to bridge the Old West with the New West, and so the architecture architects have met that challenge and have, with the selection of materials, with the design of this building, have helped to, to um, see that we indeed are meeting that uh, objective of ours of wanting to connect the Old West with the New West and also looking to the future. There are numerous ways for which this building really speaks to uh, our sensitivity and responsibility to the American West. Well, we certainly thank you for giving us a little bit of your time to describe uh, the awesomeness here at the Western Spirit Scottsdale's Museum of the West uh, facility and all that's included uh, here at this particular facility. Again, we've been visiting with Mike Fox, the museum director and CEO. And Kevin, this place is just one of the many things to do if folks are making plans like they should be to join us here in the Phoenix area for the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and in CBA Trade Show. With that, we'll go ahead and send it back to you. Thanks, Russell. Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll look back at a special holiday story about a Christmas tree farm and explain why growing trees is harder than you may think. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Let's go to New Orleans and the 2019 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. It's the cattle industry's biggest convention for the first time ever in Cajun country, the Big Easy, a place filled with fun, food, and incredible sights. And you can't afford to miss the huge NCBA Trade Show. Oh, this trade show is fantastic. I mean, it's so much fun to come down here. There's no better place for cattlemen and women to learn, have fun, and connect with fellow producers from across the country. Networking, see the people. I mean, you learn a lot here. Amazing speakers, unbeatable education, all for cattle producers in the Big Easy. So plan now to go to New Orleans for the 2019 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show, January 30th through February 1st. Visit ncba.org for more. Welcome back. We're looking back at some of our favorite stories from the past including a fun one we did around Christmas time. Brian Baxter has the story of an Indiana operation whose crop of choice keeps them in the Christmas spirit all year long. Tom Dahl knows what it is that makes a real Christmas tree so special. Every tree is individually handcrafted by God. You know, there's not another one like it out there. Dahl's Christmas tree farm is located in Thorntown, Indiana. This diversified, multi-generational operation used to raise cattle and hogs while growing corn and soybeans. But in 1985, they gave up the livestock and added trees to the mix. The trees don't have to be fed twice a day, and they smell better. So we can go away and leave them and not have to worry about somebody taking care of them. We don't have to worry about the water freezing, water lines freezing, and all that kind of stuff. So I miss the livestock, but I don't miss the livestock. Think the cattle business requires a lot of planning for the future? At Dulls, they always have to think years ahead. From the time that we plant a tree, and the trees are, are two to three years old when we plant them, until we cut it, it's about seven years. And so it's a challenge trying to think about seven years from now, what's our demand gonna be? What kind of trees are people gonna want? How many trees do we need to plant? You know, here it is the, the second week of after Thanksgiving and our Christmas tree field is virtually bare already because we didn't anticipate seven years ago that we would have the demand that we have today. We mainly grow three varieties uh, for Christmas trees. Um, those are Scotch pine, white pine, and canane fir. The most popular by far is the canane fir. A lot of people know the name Fraser fir. We have unfortunately cannot grow Fraser fir, but a canane is a close cousin 
uh, to the Frasers and they grow really well for us. Most people have eight or nine foot ceilings. Um, so the most popular size is somewhere between seven and a half and eight feet tall. We do sell trees as small as two feet tall to put on a table and we sell them as big as 12, 14, 16 feet tall for people who have a nice big room to put it in. But the majority is seven to eight feet, which is why it's a seven to eight year growing cycle. Uh, the trees grow on average about a foot a year in height. Altogether, the Dulls have around 45 acres of Christmas trees growing on the gentle slopes around the farm. Over the years, they've branched out into other holiday-related areas and added loads of entertainment options for kids. For many, it's become a holiday tradition to visit Dulls and hunt for a tree in this family-friendly environment. We greet them when they come out of the parking lot. We have greeters that greet them. We provide everything that they need except their opinion. They have to bring their opinion with them, but we'll provide the saw and the cart. And then once they select their tree and bring it back up to us, then we will trim off any basal branches so it's got a nice handle to put in the tree stand. And then we will we'll shake it, we'll bale it, and we'll tie it on the car for them and, and send them on down the road. At Dulls, they have a couple of other great traditions. Each year, the farm donates to Trees for Troops, which sends a little bit of Christmas spirit to military families serving overseas. Also, they have one day a year when they bring in some extra furry staff members to help pull trees out of the fields. Today we have a dog day going on. We've got a dog rescue club that comes and uh, brings some of their big Newfoundland dogs out to pull some trees for people. And they use it as a fundraiser and we use it to bring out a bunch of dog lovers. So it makes for a good day. That's one of the, um, one of the most common questions we get before the season opens. What day is dog day? When are the dogs going to be there? And so that's, uh, it, it's become really popular. At Dull's Tree Farm, Christmas isn't just a season, it's a way of life. And they love sharing the spirit of Christmas with their customers and encouraging them to pass down the tradition of finding the perfect Christmas tree with future generations. That's kind of our goal is to not just sell a Christmas tree, but is to sell an experience that families are going to remember. A lot of people think we sell Christmas trees, but we don't, we sell the experience. Uh, you know, when people come to get their Christmas tree, they experience a whole other array of emotions and, and things that go along with that as well. Our tree farm motto here, with a name like ours, is brighten up your Christmas with a real dull tree. Reporting from Thorntown, Indiana, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. One of the most important things cattlemen and women can do is join the fight to protect our industry by becoming a member of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. It's easy to do. Just call 1-866-233-3872 or visit the website ncba.org. Still ahead on this special edition of Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we've got an exclusive look at what life is like at home for the cowboy poet Baxter Black. Stay with us. We'll be right back. No matter what job I've got to do, my John Deere 5 e tractor can do it all. Whether I'm cutting, moving feed, or building a fence. Using my 5e means my work gets done faster at a price I can afford, and that works for me. Say goodbye to your toughest pasture and rangeland weeds for good. Because one product offers season-long control, handles the widest spectrum of broadleaf weeds, and clears the way for increased forage with greater grazing flexibility. So you get more beef per acre at a cost that can't be beat. It's Grazon Next HL Herbicide. And if it's in your pastures, plain and simple, weeds won't be. Welcome back to this special edition of Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Now, each week we get to enjoy the wit and wisdom of Baxter Black. Recently, we had a chance to visit Baxter at his home in Arizona and see what life is like for the cowboy poet. 
flying high over the southeast corner of Arizona, you might just spot the land that Baxter Black calls home. He runs cattle on this land and spends plenty of time on horseback. But visit with the cowboy poet and you'll find that just about any question you ask might be fodder for a joke. I thought maybe we could just start at the very beginning and you could give us the Baxter Black from I was born in, I went to school here, and kind of what brought you here. A brilliant idea, Kate, but a lot of people really aren't interested in that. Not to disagree, but we actually think people are interested in how Baxter took the path to become a humorist and a cowboy poet. The biggest questions that I get are, I thought you was a veterinary. What are you doing up here telling stories? <laughs> That's the first one. Everybody who is listening to, to this knows that I am not a rancher in the category of most of the people you have on there that I admire. Uh, and I still feel that uh, I'm working for you. That's what I am. I'm, you're, you're not, you don't like me because I'm a great cowman. No doubt you've seen Baxter on television sharing his poems and stories, and you may have met him in person at a cattle industry convention or other gathering. One thing is clear, Baxter has a true passion for agriculture and the cattle business. She knows I'm not the owner. We're not into protocol. She's a cow, and I'm a cowboy. And I guess that says it all. And I think everybody here or anybody listening, you have a, a cow to th thank for what you have. And that's not just money, because as anybody knows who goes broke, well, I was doing it because I wanted to do it. So whatever that seed is inside people who are agriculturally oriented, I've got it. But I'm one of those people who grew up and said, I wanna, this is what I want to be a part of and I don't know what I have to do to be a part of it, um, but I will I'll do that. And so I went to animal science, and then the only reason I went to vet school because I couldn't figure out what I was going to do with a, an animal science degree. And I gave that some thought, and I said, well, if I was a veterinarian, I could go out to somebody's place and bang on the door and say, uh, I'd like a job. And uh, he would say, well, what can you do? And I could say, I can fix your cow. <laughs> and that's as simple as it was. Baxter worked as a large animal vet first on feedlots and later for a pharmaceutical company. In those days, he'd give presentations to producers, but he didn't like to use slides. What happened was, of course, um, I was using humor as opposed to slides. And in the end, I was actually more uh, entertaining than informative. And so uh, people started calling. And within six months, uh, the company, good company, were, they were booking me. And that first year I worked for them, I, I did 85 programs. In the end, I worked for them two years, and I did 185 producer meetings. Today, when Baxter isn't telling stories on the road or on television, he's home running cattle on his ranch just outside Benson, Arizona. I needed to be in a place where I could get good flights, and second, a sale barn. Because I have invested my life in working for cattle people, basically, and I don't care if I'm telling them stories, or selling them books, or, you know, pregnant their cow, or worming their horse, whatever it was, but that's my, my world. And for Baxter, the approach to raising cattle is pretty simple. The kind of cattle I like are cattle that will make you money. But there's so many of these composites now that you can buy a black something that's, you know, half Hereford and half Samantel and half Elephant. You know, who knows? Even more than he likes cows and telling stories, Baxter Black appreciates having a great partner in his wife Cindy. I met her at the Arizona Cattle Growers. I was the speaker at their program when we were up there in Payson. And I'm sitting on the side watching and in the middle of this hotel. And they had a little place where you could sit outside and they were making music. You know, that's kind of one of the things I like. And, and then this, this 
girl that took my heart away. <laughs> she steps up, takes that fiddle like that, and just starts playing every Bob Wills song I ever heard. And I said, my gosh, I, I need to get to know her. <laughs> Once was my heart, so why not? That's Cindy Lou and Baxter Black making music together from out there. Why not take all of me? Still ahead, it's time for Baxter Black to bring us another one of his entertaining stories. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Are you concerned about the impact government policies could have on your cattle business? One way to make your voice heard in Washington is by joining NCBA. When you join, you'll have access to key policy updates and insights from Beltway Beef. It's the best way to hear directly from NCBA's DC team. Beltway Beef provides valuable policy information, and it's free for NCBA members. Stay in touch with Beltway Beef. Join now at ncba.org. Ladies and gentlemen and followers of Cowboy Humor, I have carved another book for my funny bone guaranteed to tickle your humorous. Oh, sorry. The title is Scrambled Wisdom. Almost isn't is, is it? Which almost makes sense. It's only $19.95 plus shipping. Call 800-654-2550 or online at baxterblack.com. Here's a joke. What did he get on his IQ test? Drool. We know you're up before the dawn because the cattle rise before the sun. And you spend long hours in the saddle because the herd isn't always over the next ride. And you care for the land because you know it takes care of your family. And we know you do great work. And it's time to tell that story to the marketplace. I am I Global is here to help you do just that. ever happened to you? Well, let me tell you about three brothers. Ran a summer pasture deal, and they'd sort them when they gathered in the fall. There was never more than 50 cows, and each one had a bull. Each brother, I should say. The herd was small. Well, me and Dick would help them gather. There was calves in with them, too. But the sorting part would make a grown man cry. The three of them, all shouting from the alley at the top while Dick and I swang gates for in and by and through and back and out and staying holding left and right. That's Norman Charlotte Cross that just got past. And hold that little brindle calf. She's way too small to ship. Dad gummit, Ted, don't bring him quite so fast. Bring that one back. No, let the Hereford buy it. Now, Jack. Just leave your catch rope plumb alone. Whose cellular's ringing? That gummit Jack put that rope up. Norman, get off of the phone. Look out, the ball is on the fight. Just put her in with Ted. Not that way. No, not that gummit. She jumped the fence. Jack, you come back here. You'll never catch her now. Forget it. If you got a lick of sense. The black one in. The bramer, bye. The big calf needs a brand. I believe that's Howard's wayward bull again. The brand inspector's on his way. George said he'd take a load. So don't be holding up these gentlemen. Well, it took us nearly half a day to finish up the sort and load old George a half a trailer full. And finally, find Norm's cellular, but not till Howard called to ask if we had seen his wandering bull and take Jack by the hospital to sew his finger back then drop by the sale to watch the market drown. And remember how romantic working cattle really is. And why we've all got day jobs here in town. This is Baxter Black from out there. Thanks, Baxter. We sure enjoy our visits with you each and every week. We're back with more right after this. Stay with us. 
Do you know all you need to about working cattle? Did you know there are proven methods that can reduce stress for the animals, for you and your crew? Now there's an easy way for you to learn from the experts who can help sharpen your stockmanship and stewardship skills. In interactive sessions, you'll learn better ways to work cattle more efficiently, skills that can help put more money in your pocket. Find out more and locate an upcoming event near you at the website stockmanshipandstewardship.org. What does it mean to be dependable? It means you do what you say you'll do time and time again. Because performance isn't optional, and your task is essential. For over 95 years, we have proven ourselves to be the most dependable choice. That's why the cattlemen of this great nation trust Ritchie to provide fresh water on demand. Ritchie, proud to be a partner to the American cattlemen since 1921. Welcome back. We're wrapping up the show with legacy photos as we share some great shots submitted by our viewers. Let's have a look. Well, that wraps up this edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thanks so much for spending time with us. We'll see you again next week right here on RFD TV.